Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Good evening. I'm going to be speaking tonight on following the Lord holy. Now, in the past, I've talked about following the Lord holily, H-O-L-Y, but tonight, I'm talking about following the Lord holy with a W, W-H-O-L-L-Y. And uh, I'm taking from my text tonight, we're going we're gonna to look into the book of Numbers first, and we're going to study the life of, jo of, of Caleb and Joshua. And I want to make some... So I've been studying this pretty much all day. I've been in this all day, just meditating, and I cannot believe really how how serious the issue of faith is. I've, I've been in a study on faith for about a year, and let me tell you, it's it's not. I'm not coming to a conclusion. I'm just seeing how much faith touches every aspect of our Christian life, and especially when it comes to the issue of of fullness, the issue of following following through. So there's two people that we're going to look at, Joshua and Caleb. If you have your Bible, go there to Numbers 13. I'm going to give people a few minutes to log on, a few seconds anyway to log on. I see people continuously logging on, so we want to, don't want to stop once I start. But if you got your Bible, we're going to start in Numbers 13. And you're going to see that this issue of faith isn't a New Testament, Old Testament issue. It's a... It's a God issue because we have a faith God. So everything with God is predicated on faith. And really what God's looking for from us, his followers, is faith. And if he doesn't see faith, then, then we're not a success. No matter what else we do, no matter what else uh, activity is going on, whether it's religious activity or otherwise, if it's not, if it's not done in faith, it's, it's meaningless. Hey, Marty, Art, God bless you guys. So, all right, we'll start ahead and... Uh, if you log on late, you'll have to go back to get the beginning. But we're going to talk about holy following the Lord. Following the Lord holy. Holy with a W. W-H-O-L-L-Y. Now, in the Old Testament, you know that the children of Israel was, were, were put into slavery in Egypt. And at a certain time, after 400 years, God decided he'd get his people out. He raised up Moses, a deliverer. He sent Moses to the, to the Pharaoh. And we know that part of the story. Johnny, hey, God bless you guys. We know that part of the story. So once God delivers his children out of Egypt, it's important to note that he delivered them through supernatural means. It wasn't, it wasn't natural. It was amazing. It was profound. It was, it was awe-inspiring. There's no more miracles, I mean, other than the life of Jesus. In the whole, new, whole Bible, the, that little exodus where God's delivering his people is so packed full of the supernatural, so, so packed full of miracles. So God decides to take his people through an outstretched arm. That's important to know. So when they come to the place, finally, where it's time for them to take the promised land that God had been bringing them toward, had promised, had showed them, the, the, the one issue that was above all other issues was the issue of whether or not they would trust God. Another word for faith is trust. Another word that I think maybe even depicts it even better, what faith is, is confidence. And we'll, we'll, we'll cover some New Testament scripture here shortly. But the issue of confidence is the issue of faith. Confidence, not self-confidence. The Bible doesn't call us to self-confidence as much as we hear about self-confidence. The Bible says we have no flesh. We, that, we are the circumcision who worship God in spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, it says, and have no confidence in the flesh. So we're not talking about self-confidence. We're talking about confidence in what God's word teaches now, the Old Testament saints that we're going to study here, they had the word of the Lord. They had the word of the Lord through Moses. But we have as much, as much a word in our generation in the New Testament as they did. In fact, we have a new covenant that says it's built on much better promises. Not just better, but much better. We have a much better covenant with much better promises. As much as they had the word of God, we have the word of God. As much as they were commanded to have faith, we are more commanded to have faith. And as much as the issue with them before they could enter into the land was the issue of trusting and having confidence in God, that is the same issue. All of us that are following Jesus Christ, our main objective, our main obstacle is the, is this, the obstacle of unbelief. It's the obstacle of losing our confidence, losing our faith. And we're called to the fight, the fight, the good fight of faith to lay hold on eternal life. So the spies at this point when they were brought to the promised land 
there's 12 spies that, that Moses selects at the order of God to take and, and to send into the, hey, Luann and James, God bless you guys, to send into the promised land. Now, these, these spies were told by Moses, go into the land. You can read all this in the beginning of, of, of Numbers chapter 13. He said, go into the land, spy it out. Hey, Miguel, God bless you guys. Spy it out and come back with a report and tell us whether the land is good, it's bad, it's got wood, it's got, what was it, fruitful? Is, is, what's the land? They, want, they were to go in and now keep in mind, these are the choicest men. These are the elders. These are the rulers of the people of the tribes of Israel. Two of those rulers are Joshua. He's from the tribe of Ephraim, uh, one of Dan, uh, uh, Joseph's sons. And then you have Caleb, who's of the tribe of, ironically, Judah, the same tribe Jesus comes from. So if Caleb and Joshua, two of the chief men, and then you had 10 uh, 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 additional men that were sent out as a spy party to go look at the promised land. Now, remember, this is the land of promise. This is the land that God promised, not just to them, but to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. This, this promise goes way beyond them. It's, it's a promise that God tied his name to. He said, he said to Abraham that I will bring you into this land. He showed them, this people, through supernatural means, by bringing them out of their slavery. He showed them by opening the sea and raining down manna and all of the other miracles. He's already showed them his power, his ability, that he's, he's going to keep his word. But then he brings them to the land and he sends out these spies. Now, in verse, uh, we'll, we'll pick up in Numbers, verse 21. And this is where the spies now are going into the land. And it says, So they went up and searched the land from the wilderness of Zin unto Rehob as men come to Hamoth, and they ascended by the south and came to Hebron, where Ahim and Sheshai and Talmai and the children of Anak were. Now, these were giants, by the way, the children of Anak. So Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. And they came to the brook Eshkol. The word Eshkol means cluster because it's full of fruit there. They came to the, to the brook of Eshkol, and they cut down there a branch with, which had one cluster of grapes, and they bear it between two upon a staff. Two men had to carry one cluster of grapes on a staff. That's how heavy, that's how fruitful this land was. And they, they carried this back to the land. And they took some pomegranates and some figs. So the place was called Eshkol because of the cluster of grapes with the, which the children of Israel cut down from there. And they returned from searching the land after 40 days. So they spent 40 days in the land. And they went and came to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation, the children of Israel, under the wilderness of Paran and Kadesh, and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation, and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him, we had, we, and said, We came to the land where you sent us, and surely it flows with milk and honey. It is a fr and, and this is the fruit of it, and they, they showed them the fruit. Nevertheless, now listen to this closely. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land. And the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak. That's the giants there. And the Amalekites dwell in the land. And the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Ammonites and the Canaanites dwell in, in the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses. So Caleb pipes up and says, wait, wait, wait. He sees where this is going. The elders of the people, they came back. And you'll notice after seeing this great land that was just like God said it would be, Instead of coming back and, and, and glorifying God, they immediately start glorifying the, the, the people, the, the power, the fenced walls. Their eyes are fixed on the obstacles, not on God. That's noteworthy. Their, their report immediately starts off by naming the problems. Now, there's a lot of Christians doing this today. And I don't, I don't, I don't want to speak, uh, I don't want to beat around the bush with you tonight. I, I feel a word burning in me tonight to give you. There are a lot of people that are Christian, called themselves Christians, and are glorifying their situations, glorifying their obstacles, glorifying their problems. They are they're becoming depressed. They're becoming oppressed. They're becoming besieged by evil. They're becoming fearful and every other thing that the Christian is not supposed to be. And the, uh, and the problem is the same problem that these people face because the, the uh, obstacles that these people are facing are the very obstacles that we are facing. God has given us all a promise. Now, our promised land is different, obviously, than theirs. Theirs was a literal land flowing with milk and honey. Ours is a spiritual promised land. God has promised us not just heaven, but much more before we even get to heaven. He's promised us great blessing. He's promised us great power of the Holy Ghost. He's promised us ministry. He's promised us fruit. He's promised us reward, both in this life and in the life to come for being faithful servants. But every time 
Men throughout the ages, women throughout the ages have received the promise of God. They've also encountered this, what I'm going to call the wilderness delusion. What these men are facing is a wilderness delusion. It happens to everybody that follows Christ. Every single person that will do anything significant for God must go through the wilderness delusion. It's no, no, no secret that Jesus Christ was anointed of the Holy Ghost in power to go around doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him, as it says in Acts 10.38. But we know from reading Matthew 3 and Luke 3, immediately after he was baptized in water, the Holy Ghost came down upon him in the form of a dove, overshadowed him, empowered him, filled his life, and immediately it said the Spirit drove him into the wilderness to be who to be tempted by the devil, to see the first supernatural being he sees is Satan after his empowerment of the Holy Ghost. We would call that the wilderness delusion. Jesus consecrates himself, devotes himself, gets baptized, gets filled with the Holy Ghost, and immediately has to go to the wilderness for the wilderness delusion, and he's hungry, and he's thirsty, and he's fasting, and Satan comes and tempts. Now, this is the, this is the reality that we all must face. Now, now, Jesus only faced it for 40 days. Uh, he had a very short ministry and life of three years, a ministry life of three, three and a half years, so everything he went through, it was very, very quick, but also he came through uh, with great with great obedience and great faith. So if you come through with faith, you don't need to stay in the wilderness very long. Unfortunately, people who don't respond with faith, don't respond with confidence in God, don't persevere and don't overcome the wilderness delusion, stay in the wilderness much longer than they have to. And we see that in this story that we're reading in Exodus, Numbers. These people end up staying in the wilderness for 40, 40 plus years because they didn't come through in faith. And God would not allow them to enter into the land in unbelief. You, you could not secure, because this promise was tied to Abraham, and Abraham is the father of faith, whose, whose father we are if we're born again, the Bible says in Galatians chapter 3. But because this is a promise predicated on the promise of Abraham, it has to be received by faith. And so if it comes, if it comes short of faith, if it ends up in depression and fear and poor me and anxiety, you know, any other thing other than confidence and trust and faith, then what ends up happening is you go in circles year after year. And I'm going to tell you, many of us are going in circles in our spiritual life because what we're in is not the faith that God desires. So stick with me and we'll get, we'll get to that. Now back to the story. They come and they give an evil report. Now Caleb as the, as the ten spies are, begin to magnify the, what's wrong, the obstacles, the troubles ahead, and everything that they're going to have to face that they can't face, and they start with their negativity, Caleb stills the people and he says, wait a second. Caleb, it says, verse 30, this is Numbers 13, 30, Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it. Man, I love that. But that is so powerful. And listen to the rest of this. For we are well able to overcome it. I love that. While the other 10 spies are only seeing the obstacles, the problems, what's wrong, Caleb stills the people and says, let us go up at once and possess the land. There's nothing keeping us from possessing this land. We are more, he said, more than conquerors. That's a New Testament verse. We're more than conquerors in Christ. Well, Caleb got that revelation in the Old Testament. We're more than able to possess this land. Nothing can, can stop us. But the men that went up with him said, we are not able. Here, here they're sealing their fate with this state. You know, the power of your words, you know, sometimes we murmur and we complain against our, our spouse or against our pastor or against somebody else. And, you know, we might think that the word is going against them, but without knowing it, the real person that we're murmuring and complaining against is God. Because everything in our life, if we're following God, is, up, is predicated and wrapped and surrounded by Him. So when we're complaining about what's wrong with our situation, we're really complaining silently about God, saying, why are you letting me go through this? Why, am I, why are these people hating me? Why am I being misunderstood? Or whatever else. And we need to see it that way because everything that happens to the believer has to be approved by God. So if we're in a temptation, we're in a trial, we're in a hardship, it's in God's permissive will. God's allowing that to happen. So the, the quicker that we identify it as a, as, a, as a trial, as a wilderness delusion, and choose by a matter of our will to have confidence in God and speak words of life, we will go through that thing no matter what it is. But if we get into a self 
a pity party in a depressive state and start glorifying all that's wrong, God doesn't take too kindly to that. And you'll, we'll go on to read here, verse 32, it says, and they brought up an evil report of the land that they had searched. An evil report, they spoke evil. They spoke negatively about what they saw. And it, and it caused the people to go into a frenzy. So the land that they searched, it's a land eaten up with inhabitants. There's so many people. There's so many obstacles, they're saying. And all the people that we saw are men of great stature. They're glorifying the men. And we saw the giants, some of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so were we in their sight. They are saying, we look like grasshoppers to these huge, powerful people. We are not able to go take the land. Can you imagine after having seen the glory of God, having seen the, the Red Sea open, having seen all of the miraculous and mighty provisions of God, water coming out of a rock and manna falling from, can you imagine getting to a place where because there's strong people in the land that after seeing God do all that, you, you couldn't believe that God is more than able? How, how is it that only one man, uh, uh, Caleb, becomes the voice against these 10 other spies, you know, obviously Joshua backs him up, but Caleb, this one man said, we are more than able to go up at once. Let's go now and take the land. But the people, the majority of the choicest elders and leaders in Israel were unable to come to a place of faith. They all had the same word from God. They all had the same promise. They were all born of the same nation. They all knew the, the, the promise of God to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and yet only one of them out of the other 10, were able to come to a place where he could speak with such faith, words of hope and confidence. Well, I'm going to tell you, we're in an obstacle now. We're in a wilderness delusion. All of us in this land are in some kind of a wilderness, good possibility. And we're going through things that we don't understand. And I'm going to tell you, Jesus said it's impossible that offenses should come. It's that they will, they're going to come. No matter what, it's impossible that they will not come. Uh, and we're going to face, we're going to face obstacles within Mostly, unfortunately, the, the biggest adversity and obstacles that we come through as Christians are at the hands of other Christians. We're, we're going to face. I can't tell you how many Christians, uh, being a pastor for over eight years, and then I've been discipling people for 15 years. And I can't, I can't tell you the number of people that I've encountered that have stopped going to church, stopped seeking God in a real way because they were offended or hurt or upset by other Christians or church, a church leader or a pastor or whatever, a ministry, it did them wrong. And so now they've hit a wall and they're just overly negative. And if you give them a chance to speak about where they are, what comes out of them is overly negative. They have no words of faith, no words of confidence, no words. It's always the glorifying of what went wrong, what happened bad. And if you get enough Christians together that have had this happen, they'll sit in a circle and talk for hours about what's wrong with the church and why everything's wrong and what happened to them. And it's just a big, huge self-pity party. And, I, and I, I don't want to offend anybody, but I'll be happy to if it'll help you get out of your rut because God can't bless that. God is waiting for us to speak words of faith. Who cares what happened in the past? Who cares who let you down? Who cares who offended you? Who cares what didn't go right? God is more than able to take the land through you all at once if our eyes could just get off of the problem and get on God. Now, if you go through the rest of the book, because I, I didn't, I'm, this isn't really what I want to, I just want to get onto the New Testament, but I want to lay this groundwork so that you understand and I can understand what happened in the Old Testament because the New Testament, which we're about to see, discusses this exact event three times at least in the book of Hebrews in the uh, chapter 3 and then again in chapter 4 and then again in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. The Bible actually says that these events that I just am reading to you from are examples to us upon whom the ends of the world are come. So I'm not taking this out of context by using an Old Testament example. The Bible says this was an example for us, the church, upon whom the ends of the world come because the same obstacle that they're fighting through, we're gonna have to fight through. Only ours isn't physical giants. It isn't physical enemies. It's spiritual enemies in high places. And, and if we're not careful, we can't even see with our spiritual eyes and we only see in our natural eyes and we get stuck in doubt, we get stuck in complaining, we get stuck in depression and fear and we can't go on into what God has for us. So we gotta guard ourselves. Now, there's one, I told you the subject of my message tonight was to follow the Lord wholly, W-H-O-L-L-Y. I'm gonna give you 
uh, several chapters of the Bible that I'm just going to quote them to you. I've got them written down here. And you go back and read these passages and, and you'll see it so clearly. But this word holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, this is what God said uh, after he comes now. He comes down, and, and you won't see God as angry as you see him here in the book of Numbers, chapter 13, going in, and then chapter 14, he comes down and begins to pronounce his judgment. Now, he listens to the two reports. You have the report of Caleb and Joshua, and then you have the report of the unbelieving elders, the leaders. And God, God himself now has a report. He hears. God hears from heaven. He's listening to everything we say, whether our words are words of faith and words of trust and confidence or whether our words are doubt and unbelief. He's listening from heaven. And he comes down with such anger and he says, and, and, and as, as the elders continue on in, in chapter 14 with their negative report, Joshua and Caleb, it says, tear their clothes. It says Aaron and Moses fall down on their face. They understand what's happening here. The people are just complaining and whining and crying and casting negative reports. They don't know how serious what they're doing. But people with faith understand, what are you guys doing? You guys are destroying yourselves right now by your own words. You're not making God happy. And they throw themselves down. They're tearing their clothes. And on, on and on these men go with their evil report. And then suddenly God comes down. And he, he begins to judge now between the two reports. He says of those wicked people with the, that are elders, the cream of the crop of, of the tribes of Israel, he says of them, because you have made an evil report and have caused the people to fear and unbelief and, and go into doubt, you will not see this land. You will die. Your carcasses will fall in the wilderness. And God is so, not only is he angry, he got probably angry when he flooded the earth because of their wickedness, but in this particular, or in Sodom and Gomorrah, or when he whipped the Pharisees, in this particular passage, not only is he angry, but you can feel his pain, his hurt. God is actually hurt by their lack of trust, their lack of faith, because he showed himself to them. He's giving them such promises that have never been, been heard on the earth before. And although that they were in relationship with God, they, they knew on some level God, they, they would not trust God. So the pain that God ex is going through here and expressing in Numbers 14 is staggering. And he says, you will die in this wilderness and you were afraid that these giants would kill your children but now i'm going to take your children into the promised land and you're going to die so he pronounces a judgment and a death but then he turns to joshua and caleb and he pronounces a whole different verdict on them and i love what god says uh here i'm going to read in numbers 32 11 and 12 God says, none of the men that came out of Egypt that are 20 years old and upward shall see the land which I swore unto Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because, listen, they have not wholly, W-H-O-L-L-Y, followed me. But Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, uh, the uh, Kenizzite, and Joshua, the son of Nun, they will because they have wholly followed the Lord. Notice that that God said because of their words of faith and trust and confidence that that was what determined that they were wholly following the Lord. And these other Israelites, leaders that they were, elders that they were, because they had not said the right thing, not believed the right thing, did not have the confidence in their heart to, per, to proceed in with God, they have not wholly followed the Lord. So the issue of them being holy followers of the Lord had, had not as much to do with their morality. They, they were the cream of the crop. I'm sure they had already passed through all the other judgments. Remember, by this time, God had already struck down many in the nation for immorality, sexual immorality, for idolatry, for complaining. And these men were still there through all of those judgments and all of those plagues. Tens of thousands of them had already been killed because of their, their sin. And these men passed through all of the moral challenges in, the, in, the, in, the, in that age. But the one thing that they weren't able to pass through was in the area of believing God, trusting God, and persevering through when the obstacles were right before them. But because Caleb and Joshua believed God, trusted God, and said, let's go up at once and take it, they were deemed to be holy followers of the Lord. Again, in Deuteronomy chapter 1, 35 and 36, God said the same thing. Those men of this evil generation will not. But Caleb, he said, the son of Jephunneh, he shall see it, and I will give it to him. The land that he trotted upon, I will give him this land because he hath holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, followed the Lord. Again in Joshua 14 now. Get this, this is so, this is beautiful. This picture is beautiful. Joshua 14 now, it, they're coming after 45 years and Caleb comes back to Joshua. Now he had to, he had to wander in circles for 45 years. He was judged in, 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 
by God as being faithful, a wholehearted follower of God. And God said he will possess the land because of it. Yet he still had to wander with the nation. He still had to, in some way, be affected by the punishment that was imposed on the nation because he was among them. So he had to wander in circles with this people for 45 years, totally. Josh, uh, Caleb was 45 years. And he comes to Joshua in, ch in chapter 14, and he said, he reminds Joshua, and remember what God said, that I would, because I wholly followed the Lord, that I would receive. And Joshua says, yes, you can read that in chapter 14, 8 and 9. And then Joshua 14, 14, it says, Hebron therefore became the inheritance of Caleb unto this day because he wholly followed the Lord. Okay, you get the picture. Now, it's, it's again in Numbers 14, 24, if you want to read it again. Now, you go down to, jo to, to Josh, uh, Caleb's testimony. Now, he said after, the, after he came back to Joshua, he said, now because I, the Lord promised me this land, I'm ready to go up at once and take it. Now, he's, he was 40 years old when he went and inspired the land. Now, he's 45 years later, he says. 85 years later, Joshua uh, and Caleb are ready to possess the land. Now, this is an 85-year-old man. I would love to uh, read to you real quick the, the testimony of Caleb after eight. Now, he's 85 years old. You guys know what an 85-year-old man looks like, usually. Typically, an 85-year-old man is frail. He's weak. You know, he's, he's anything but a warrior. But at this point, God had preserved Caleb. And here's Caleb's testimony. This is Joshua chapter 14, verse 10. And now behold, the Lord has kept me alive, as he said, these 45 years, ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now I am this day fourscore and five years old. That's 85 years old. And I am yet as strong this day. Listen to this. Caleb, an 85-year-old man. I am as strong this day, the day, the day to day, as I was when Moses spoke this. My strength hasn't failed, for I go out to war both to go out and to come in. Now, just think about what that means because in the war, they wore armor. They had heavy armor and helmet and, and sword and breastplate. Caleb said, I'm 85 years old and because of the word of God that he spoke to me way back then when I said, let's go take the land, God said, I'll, I'll preserve you. The rest of the, the people he killed off. Not only did he preserve Caleb alive so that in his old age, he could hobble into the promised land, but he kept him as strong as a young man so that 85 years old, he said he's going in and out during war. He's putting on his sword. He's been fighting now for five years before he finally comes to his, his inheritance. And he's ready now to go up at once and possess the land. He said, I am as strong today as I was when God pronounced that word. So at 85, so there's provision. There's a, there's a sustaining in faith. Listen to this. Now, therefore, he said, give me this mountain. Whereof the Lord spoke in that day, for there you heard in that day how the Anakims were there, and that the cities were great and fenced. If so be the Lord be with me, then I shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord said. He said, the giants are there. He's 85 years old. He comes back to the full circle of life, kills off everybody else and says, I'm 85. I'm as strong as I've ever been. And now since the Lord promised me this land, I'm going to go take it right now and, and drive these giants out. Does that sound like an 85-year-old man? No, it sounds like a young man. And Joshua blessed him and gave him the inheritance. You can go on and read that. It's amazing, amazing story. So the issue of God is the issue of faith. The, all the, the, the circles that we go through and all of the wilderness experiences and all of the hurts and all of the disillusionment, and I think probably that's our biggest obstacle that we're all facing is disillusionment because we start off in our Christian life with great anticipation, great excitement. I, I mean, I've seen a lot of people come to Jesus. I love watching a new believer get pumped up, excited, ready to go out and change the world. And the only thing is, after seeing it happen so many times, when I see a new believer come to Jesus, uh, or somebody rededicate their life to Jesus and get really serious about following the Lord. There's always this initial burst of excitement, always. I mean, if you're serious about God and you really surrender and you really get born again, there comes an initial burst of joy, excitement, passion, hunger, and then you think you're gonna go out and change the world. And what always happens 100% of the time is when you go out, you begin to get experience the backlash. Maybe it takes a month, maybe six months, maybe a year, maybe the very same day, but you start to experience the backlash of the wilderness delusionment. And what happens is all of the hordes of hell begin to come against your mind, begin to come against your life, begin to cause you cause you distraction, um, to, to be hurt, to be injured, to be 
disillusioned. You don't understand. I tried to do right and this happened. I don't understand. Ever since I became a Christian, it's been harder. I thought it was going to be easier. All of these these things begin to happen. So how do we fight through those? And what happens to our faith in those battles determines whether or not we go in circles. Some Christians have been going in circles for far too long, 20, 30 years, going nowhere with God. I mean, they're almost in the same identical place they were 20 to 30 years ago as they were now because they haven't progressed. They maybe haven't fully given up, but they haven't made progress. And I think we should really examine the, the fruit of our life and say, am I making progress in God or am I spinning in circles? And if we're spinning in circles, I would dare to say the reason we're not progressing and going forward is because we, we haven't accomplished, the, we haven't overcome the obstacles yet by faith and accomplished what God's real purpose for us is to enter our promised land, our inheritance, our, 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 our place of blessing. God can't let us go in until we have true faith true confidence and all self-will and all self-pity has been dealt with. And so that all we're, we're left with is the faith of Jesus Christ that says, Lord, my God, you're my all in all. Whatever you want from me, that's what I want. That's what God's after. Now, the Bible says that in 1 Timothy, this is 1.19, it says that we should hold faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have been made shipwrecked. So the Bible says some put away faith in a good conscience, and by putting it away, they've been made shipwrecked. Now, you know, I don't have to get the Greek word for shipwreck for you to know what a shipwreck is. You can get the image, if you think hard enough, of a big, glorious ship full of merchandise headed to a destination, and it hits a sandbar and busts into pieces. It's a shipwreck. Well, that's the picture Paul gives us of many of the Christians that he was dealing with back then even. Many, he said, whose faith has been made shipwrecked. In other words, they're not going anymore with God. They were on a journey. They were on their way somewhere with these treasures, and then they got shipwrecked. And now their life has become, they've gone nowhere, basically. That, when a ship wrecks, it stops moving. It stops making progress. Some, Paul said, concerning faith have been made shipwrecked. So how do we, how do we keep our faith from getting shipwrecked? And maybe your faith has gotten ship, shipwrecked. How do you get back going again? The, the, Bible's, the, the Bible's clear on that, that we need to return to the faith once delivered, the faith that we once held, the faith that we once treasured. There's a verse that I want to give you in Colossians 2, verses 6 and 7. He said, As you have therefore received the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted, built up in him, established in the faith. And then the rest of that says, abounding therein with thanksgiving. I think that might be the most important part of that exhortation. Abounding therein with thanksgiving. You want to know how you're not going anywhere with God? Or, or you, you can judge how strong your spiritual life with God is, is based on your thanksgiving. Now, I know we all give thanks for our food at certain times when we're eating, but if that's the extent, or at night you say a few words before you go to sleep, if that's the extent of your thanksgiving, there's a good chance that your faith has been made shipwreck. There's a good chance that your focus has gotten on the obstacles, the trials, the struggles, what's wrong with everybody or everything, versus on God. Because when your faith is in God, your confidence is in God, you can't help but give thanks. You can't help but praise. You can't help but, but give God honor and glory. But when your eyes are stuck on the storm, on the obstacle, on the trial, on, on what's wrong, on the enemy, on how big the giants are, without fail, your faith gets shipwrecked. Now, you might still keep going through the motions, but you're not progressing spiritually. In other words, you're no closer. You don't feel any closer to God. You don't have any more hope and confidence in his promises. You're not apprehending or laying hold on any more. You're not bearing any more fruit. You're just kind of going through a cycle where you're going through the motions. Now, Jesus dealt with this kind of Christian, and it was actually the first church that he dealt with in the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, when he talked to the church. He said, you guys are laboring. You guys are, have, not, have not given up totally. You're still laboring for my name. You're still, you're still fighting the fight in a sense. He said, but I have this thing against you. You've left your first love. He said, come back and do the first work, or I will remove your candlestick. Your candlestick was their church. I mean, that's a strict warning. If you're going through the motions, you're still doing the ministry functions, but you're not doing it out of the right faith, the right love, the right heart. And so he says, come back to the first love. Come back and do the first work, or I'll remove your candlestick. God doesn't want a church that just goes mechanically through the motions, staying active, staying busy. He wants a church that's walking by faith, that's hope is in the Lord, that's words are framed out of their adoration. 
you know what the world needs to see is more Christians that are thankful that they're born again, thankful that they're children of God, thankful that they're redeemed, thankful that they're right with God, thankful that they have a direct line of communication with the Father, thankful that God's, God's redeemed them from, from the curse of the law and that they have a purpose. The world is dying to see Christians that have faith and that their words have such life in them that, that the world will see, wow, I want what he has. He's excited and happy. You know, there's a, there's a bad thing going on in the church right now. Christians are becoming more political than I've ever heard before. Now, I, I, I listen a little bit here there on the radio. I like to know what's going on in the political world to some extent. But, I mean, Christians are getting just downright too political. And because of that, they speak more on what's wrong with the government or, or the liberals or the whoever than they do even talk about what's right with God. And so it's like even at the pulpit, I hear all about what's wrong with the, the, the government. And I don't want to hear that trash in the church. Let's glorify Jesus. You know, Philip went down to Samaria. He didn't preach world events to them and win the city. He preached Christ, it says. And they both all heard from the least to the greatest. The whole city was baptized because Philip went down there preaching Christ. He glorified Jesus and people heard it and wanted what he had because he walked in something that was glorious. The church has become so negative, so downtrodden, so, so introverted, so depressed that they're no longer glorifying God like they ought to. So pay close attention. Are you glorifying God when you come across sinners? Are you glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ or are you glorifying what's wrong with, with your boss or your job or your world? God is hearing everything that we speak. So if we go on, uh, I don't know how long I'll go with this tonight. Maybe we'll, we'll pick this up again. But I, I would suggest reading out of Hebrews chapter 3, start in verse 6 and go through chapter 4, verse 11. And it talks about this struggle of the children of Israel and how they went through this struggle and we too, the church, are going through the same struggle. It says, there remaineth therefore a rest, that they didn't enter into the rest. It was a spiritual rest that God was really after. He wanted a spiritual people that would go through spiritual struggle and would come out victorious and maintain in the same way Caleb did, his confidence, his faith, his trust, his devotion, that his words would glorify God and not circumstance, and that they would come through whatever comes on against them and come out victorious. God is still waiting on that kind of a people that will enter into rest. It's a faith life because those who believe, it says, have entered into rest. That rest that we are called to enter in, that place in God where we find confidence and trust and hope and faith and peace in his presence alone is the reality that God looks for in the earth. That's, that's really all that our struggles are to bring us to a place of total and, and complete abandon to all confidences that aren't the confidence we have in God. So until we enter into that rest, we haven't entered into any kind of true spirituality. So the Bible tells us in Hebrews 10 again, he said, let us draw near with a true heart, with a full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Listen to what he said, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Let us hold fast the profession. Now we, we start off and here's why he said, for he is faithful that promise. So let us hold fast. When we began our journey in God, as you have received the Lord, so walk in him. How did you receive the Lord? With excitement, with passion. You were gonna change the world. There was no cost too great. You'd stay up reading your Bible all night. You were hungry to know the truth. You were eager to please God. You were sensitive to his voice. It only took a whisper from the spirit of God and you would throw your dirty, rotten clothes away that were unclean, your music that was unclean, your movies that were unclean. You would have, there was no price too great in the beginning of your walk with God. And then suddenly you went into the wilderness and started to get delusionized and started to get uh, obstacles and giants and problems and troubles and things didn't go as you, as you thought they would. You romanticized your journey in God and thought it would be great and all you saw was how victorious you'd be. And then you get in the wilderness and you meet resistance. Well, God ordained these resistances to come against us so that really it would distinguish who really trusted God, who really had faith, and who was just mouthing the words. Because you know when you get in the, to the temptation, the trial, whether or not your faith is sincere. If your faith is sincere, if it's true, then your thanksgiving will be evident. You will be worshiping God. You'll be praising God. The obstacles 
either do one of two things. They either get you to fall back and get set in some mechanical state where you go through the motions, but your, your confidence is no longer in God, or they get you to a place of utter abandonment to yourself. The obstacles will either cause you to lose sight of yourself or to focus on yourself. They will either cause you to preserve yourself or to yield yourself unto God. And that's the reason that we're going through struggles. That's the reason we find resistance. God's looking to empower people. God's looking to bless people. God is looking to empower people to walk in his spirit and do great works for him in these last days. But until we get to this place where Caleb was, where our heart is wholly the Lord, so that no matter what comes against us, we don't, we don't retreat. We don't get into a place where we get into a defensive posture and cover over our head and go through the motions. If you're not living a life where you are as hungry and diligent and faithful as you were when you began your journey. I, I've seen so many new Christians come. I've seen one guy gave all of his clothes away. All he, he kept is jeans and white t-shirts, and he wore the same outfit every single day. He said, I don't want anything. I just want to look, look like an average Joe in this world and give everything to God. It was, a noble, it was a noble thing, but that only lasted about three months, and he was backslid. Because he thought that if he did this great thing and made this great show, that everything would just fall into place. He romanticized. And then the obstacles came and his family said, you're nuts. And his friends told him he's a loser, he's crazy. And all of a sudden, all of the bombardment, the disillusionment settled in and he wasn't able to overcome. I hope I don't, I've lost contact. I hope he got back in the game. But this happens time and time and time again. There are so few who seem to be able to persevere the wilderness the disillusionment, the letdowns, the struggles, and keep their faith, and not only keep it, but grow it. Because what happens if we don't keep growing in faith, growing in passion, growing in hunger, if we think we can stay with the same amount of passion and hunger we had when we started and get through this life, you're gonna be sadly mistaken. You either have to keep making, we're supposed to go from glory to glory, from faith to faith. Not to think that, you know, when you're a baby, it doesn't take much when you're a baby Christian. You know, God calls us babies. He said you're born again. He, he says as newborn babies, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow. Let us grow up into, the, into him who is the head of all things. There's lots of different passages that call us babies and tell us to grow up. When we were babies, we only had a little bit of faith and it was enough to make us go crazy after Jesus. But if we don't grow that faith by studying the word of God, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, build yourselves up on your most holy faith by praying in the Holy, Go holy Ghost, Jude tells us. If we don't grow our faith, if we don't do what it takes to build our faith and grow in God, if we think that faith that we got born again with is enough to sustain us, if we think that we can keep that faith and go on with God, what's gonna happen is we're gonna go in circles in circles. We're going to lose our thanksgiving. We're going to lose our praise. And we're not going to go anywhere significant with God. The only path forward from your rut, from going through the motions, from being mechanical, is to get back to the faith journey, to get your confidence back where it belongs in God. Though everybody let you down, don't look to man because man will let you down. Only God can be followed and your eyes have to be fixed on Jesus or you will get stuck in a rut. So in order for us to get out of the rut we're in, to get out of the mechanical place, to grow up into him who's the head in all things, we have to get our confidence. Remember, Hebrews 10, 35, he said, cast not away your confidence for it. Your confidence has great recompense of reward. And then the next statement he says, but you have need of patience, perseverance, so that after you've done the will of God, you might receive the promise. For yet a little while, it says, and he that is coming will come and will not tarry but the just shall live by faith. And if any man draws back, my soul will have no pleasure in him. God said, we know what, what God looks for. It's faith. Because without faith, Hebrews eleven six 6 says, it's impossible to please God. For those who come to him must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Are you diligently seeking the Lord? Are you pressing into the word of God? Are you building your prayer life? Are you coming with, with thanksgiving and worship and ad, adoration to God throughout the day? Or have you become mechanical? Have you gone round and round the mountain? Are you, are you just stuck in a rut and not progressing? The issue, it may be morality, it may be an issue of sin in our life that we need to get out, but there's a good chance if you've dealt with sin and you're still not seeming to break through, there's a good chance that the real issue is the issue of faith. Are you living a life of confidence and persevering trust in the word and the promise of God? Are you laying hold on God's word with faith? 
If not, it's time to get back in the game to stir yourself up, stir up your heart, stir up your confidence and begin to progress again in God. Go back to the first thing. What was it when you got born again that you saw that made you want to flee the world and go after God? What was it that you saw? Was it the treasure in the field? Was it the glory of God? Was it, I don't care what happens to me as long as God is happy, as long as I can be with Jesus, as long as I can be pleasing to God. If we could get that attitude back like little children, I think it would do a lot of us really good. I think a lot of us are downtrodden and we, we ought to go back to the simple thing. Jesus Christ is the best thing that ever happened to any of us. And no matter what we face and no matter what we've gone through, if we can get back to that simple reality that Jesus Christ is Lord of all and wants us to, to overcome and will cause us to overcome if our eyes are on him, I think we could get back to abiding in the vine. We would bear fruit all by ourselves. Remember, if we abide in the vine, we can, we'll bear much fruit because without Jesus, we can do nothing. In other words, if our heart isn't right with Jesus, we can do nothing. We have to learn just to abide and be thankful and be worshipers of Christ. So, those who have faith are those who wholly, W-H-O-L-L, -L, follow the Lord. The, Greek, the Hebrew word for holy, by the way, I looked this up today in the Old Testament. I went through those verses. The word holy is, is the word, it, it's male, M-A-L-E. It looks like the word male in the English, but it's actually male. It means to be fulfilled. It means to be the fullness. It means to be uh, to overcome. It means to persevere. It means in its in its final conclusion to accomplish what God has for you. So when He says that they have wholly followed me, what God is saying is they went all the way with me. They didn't get to a certain point and then just lose it. They went all the way to its fulfillment, to its accomplishment. And they made it. They, they really grabbed hold onto me when it looked like impossible, when it looked like I couldn't make it, when it looked like all everybody's against me. They look past all of that and they look to me. God, I like what Smith Wigglesworth said. He said, God will step over one million people to help a person who has faith. God looks for faith. Without faith, we can't please God. We must believe that he is. If, I, if you heard the audible voice of God say, if you will seek me diligently, you will be rewarded. If you heard an audible voice say that to you, if you seek me diligently, you will be rewarded. I bet every one of us would call a halt to what we're doing and we would get to our prayer rooms and we would be seeking God so diligent. Well, why do we need an audible voice to tell us that? We have the word of God that tells us that right in Hebrews eleven six. 6. If we will diligently seek God, he will reward us. God wants to reward us, but he can't reward us until we diligently seek him with faith and confidence and hope and trust. And so if we would get back to the simple thing, I believe there's a blessing for all of us in Jesus' mighty name, and I love you, and I hope you're all doing well. God bless.